you guys asked me was tactics for playing on different surfaces. Now, when you guys play away, most of the courts are hard courts, astro, yeah. not so much grass and clay. Lots of hard courts. Lots of hard courts. So, yeah. difference between surfaces, mainly is the way the ball bounces and the way that you need to position yourself according to the bounce. So, obviously, if we're playing on a quicker surface, like an astro or a grass, the ball tends to bounce a lot lower, um, therefore quicker. So, if we're playing on a slower surface, like a clay or a hard court, the ball bounces higher, slower so we've got a bit more time with that in mind because the ball's bouncing higher we need to be a bit further away and position ourselves further back than we normally would and on a faster surface like an astro or grass actually we need to be a little bit closer because the ball's not bouncing up as high so we're going to have to take it earlier before the ball drops so that's the key with different surfaces was there any other questions around surfaces that you wanted to talk about there was a question yeah. on the hard courts yeah like you said back yeah. But some of the courts haven't got as much. No, so in, in that case, so it's actually in your face. Yeah, so in that bounces. case, it's very difficult. And what you tend to find is players that are used to playing on those courts are very good at taking the ball on the rise. Yeah. Whereas actually, we've got the luxury of having nice big backdrops at the back, and actually, we don't have to take the ball on the rise. We wait for the ball to drop, which is easier to do, much tougher to take the ball on the rise. So it's something that we can practice. Um, Lots of the time you'll find yourself, when you have a shorter backdrop, you're having to take the ball really high up here, you'll take it early and it's out of your comfort zone. So it's just something that maybe we need to practice a little bit more of. But um, most clubs tend to have a bit more space. And if they do have space, you've got time to get back, let the ball drop and hit it at a nice, comfortable waist type or slightly higher. Okay, but yeah, good question. Say, the what? match at Stubbington, they didn't. Oh. And it was yeah, a hard court. Very short. And it was bouncing right up here. And they're all used to it. And I didn't know what yeah. I was... It was in the face, yeah, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I didn't hit it at all. The only thing really you can do there is take it early and, and you yeah. know, try to take it before it gets too high. So, you know, as it's rising at waist height, not letting it get too high. So in that case, actually, you do need to stand closer to, to the bounce. But it's very tricky um, surface by surface. Cool. So that, that's just a brief overview of, of surfaces. We can, we can bring it into our practice in a minute. We'll talk about it. Next one was how to play to own strengths and not let opponents dominate with their style. So what you really need to do in this one so when we're talking about our own strengths are we talking about the way we play as a pair or are we saying that our strengths are like a forehand and our backhand? what do we mean by no, that we like playing stuff. Like, look, we prefer, I think, like, attacking play, don't we? yeah Moon ballers. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we probably get frustrated and then get caught into that looping. Yeah. And try to finish the point off quickly. And then yeah. Take round. I think in general it's probably safe to say that we all, when we play against better players that hit the ball well, hit the ball hard and, and aggressively, it actually brings the best out in our game, doesn't mm -hmm. it? So we can actually play good tennis because the ball's coming at a pace and we can redirect it really well. It, the one is the moon ballers when it comes in very very slow. The only thing you can really do about that is not get sucked into it try to hit the ball at a comfortable height so like we said if you've got time get back let it drop and hit your normal strokes rather than fighting to try and hit the high ones hit it at a more comfortable height and if you feel confident take it early but it's a tough one again playing against the moon ballers the only way you're going to do it coming into the net is another good way of, of playing against those players because when they're hacking the ball up and up and up their job is to try and keep you back and if you can come into the net and get your racket behind the ball Obviously, a volley, sure, is going to kill the point. They're going to give you a few smashes, but if you're confident in that smashing, absolutely fine. And they do tend to just lob it over lob it back. Us. Yeah. Well, we're not particularly top. tall, are we? No. no. Well, no. Well, 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 yeah, I'm not going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Even when it's bad twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our yeah. partner was um, the, the one in the front. Yep. And say so I'm at the back. Yep. And then they lob it over my partner's head. Yep. And then I go to that side, take that ball. My partner then goes across to the yes. other space. Yes. Should that partner then come back a step, sort of like towards here, rather than Good stay question. So closer to the net? If I'm, if I'm here, volleying, and I've yeah. got him in the back there, yeah. okay. they've lobbed me. Yeah. Him comes across yeah. to cover me. Yeah. We shout switch. Yeah. I come across here. Switch, now, but... some people shout switch. <laughs> Sometimes you can just see. But if you, if you need shout switch, it's good to shout switch to make it clear. Right. Some people will just stay there. Um, once that shot's gone back, we can see if that's been a really good lob, then actually this player will come in. If, we, if you've hit it well when you've covered me, 
you'd come in and I would come in too. If you've hit a really weak shot, that's when I would go back. So it all depends on how that shot is hit. Yeah. Good, loads of questions. Okay, here's another question then. So next question, I was quite far away from the net here, I was, I was stood here. Are we all happy with how close to the net we should stand when we're playing? Okay, just a quick one then. So I tend to say, don't ever stand behind the service line when you're the volley player. Don't even stand near the service line. We want to be in the service box. I notice quite a lot of us stand back here. The risk of this is the ball coming and landing at our feet. So ideally, if we're in a neutral situation where neither of the teams have an advantage, so it's just kind of like a rally, the volley player should stand halfway up in the box. Because this way, you're close enough to the net to attack, and you're far enough away to give yourself enough time. If your partner behind you hits a really good effective shot, and they're under a bit of pressure, you're gonna move into the first quarter of the service box to be ready to kill the point. If your partner hits a weaker shot, you'll move to the back quarter, so about here, because it gives you more time for them to hit the faster oncoming shot. So during the point your position will change, if they've hit it really well, move in, look for the contestant and hit the volley. If they've hit it really weak, move back and be ready for a more defensive shot. So if, you're, if your partner is serving, yeah. and you're in the box, we still have to stand on the line so we can see if the ball has gone in. Yeah. Is that the exception to that rule, or should we, no. if you're standing anywhere in the box? Receiving, sorry, when you're receiving, receiving, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, not um, sorry. The priority is to win the point, isn't okay. it? So, I, although you can see the line better, yeah. I would focus on what you're doing to hit the next shot rather than worrying so much about calling the ball. Of course, that's important. On the clay course, we can see the bounce afterwards, yeah. it's fine. Here, you can still see the line, so I would prioritise playing a good point over worrying about calling the ball in and out. You'll be able to call it anyway. Um, most of the time, if you're playing singles, you've yeah. got to, that person's got to call it themselves yeah. anyway. Yeah. So it's just a, a, you know, it's a nice thing having a line judge, but your priority is playing the point as opposed to being a line judge. So I, I would stand in here. Okay. Yes. Um, going back to the previous point, yeah. um, you were standing in the middle, yeah. fish, and the partner would have played the shot, and it goes sort of like high, but sort of like towards the back. Yeah. Would you stand back because you think they're going to smash? So that you get more time, or would you stay sort of like closer to the net because it okay. was a good deep shot? So if you were playing against Ingrid, yeah. and Ingrid's at the back, yeah. and the shot comes up here, yeah. would you expect Ingrid to blast 150 mile an hour smash? So no, depending <laughs> on who you're playing against. If you were playing against Andy Murray, yeah. stand back. So just gauge the opponents. Yeah, another, another good question. I'll quickly go to the next one here. That's a good it's good that you've got, yeah, it's a really good question. It's just knowing your opponents, really, and, and yeah. you get to know them in the warm up. You'll see what their strengths are. Some of them will be, you know, really powerful hitters, some will be more defensive players. Um, that was the next question how to cope with serial lobbers and where to stand. <laughs> so, um, so that one we were talking Send about. To prison. <laughs> if you can, come into the net because it, yes. you know, it cuts things out, it forces them to hit a really good lob. If they hit a weak lob, you'll have an easy smash. If they hit too hard, it will go out. So make them as uncomfortable as possible. Okay? Don't just lob it back, because that makes it very easy, and you'll get caught up in what they're doing. Um, so, where, so if you come in and they are the lobbers... Yeah, don't come in close. Where Stand. You try and pick your shot to um, stop them lobbing you again? To stop them... If you, so when you come in, when we say come into the net, because we're expecting it to come up high, They've not in the past been very good at hitting drop shots and things, it's mainly high shot. We can stand back a bit further and ideally we want to actually bring them in because they're probably quite comfortable just chipping it away at the back. If we bring them in as well, it's going to take them out of their comfort zone. You can't lob when you're at the net very effectively, it's much easier to do at the back of the court. So I think it's reading the tennis racket on your, part, on your opponent, so reading whether, whether it's an open racket face or whether that's... That, yeah. that, previous shot so if I was watching you hit rather than just watching your racket yeah. I know that if I've hit the ball really really well yeah. you can only hit a short ball and if I've hit it yeah, shorter you, know you could hit it deeper so it's just yeah. having a you know a, an understanding anticipation of that so then we say 
when you have two players at the net. No, when to have two players at the net, and when to have two back, and when to have one forwards and one back. Okay. Who likes volleying? Who likes being at the net? Out of you guys. You don't have to have. You don't have to have normal formation. When we look at traditional doubles, we've got somebody at the back, somebody at the net. You don't have to. You could have two people starting at the back if you feel way more comfortable. It does give you a big advantage when you come into the net because we take our opponent's time away. But if you really struggle at the net, don't be afraid to, to hang at the back. Now, I think we're all okay at the net, so I would suggest having one back and one in the net. The person at the back, if you can, come in to join them as well because having two players up in the net is much tougher than having one at the back. As soon as you've got one at the back, the player at that end will just keep it cross-court, keep it cross-court, and it's quite easy, there'll be a long, long rally. As soon as you can get into the net, you can cut the point off, save yourself energy, and finish the point quite quickly. So, as soon as you get a short ball, try to come in on that one. Um, yeah, don't. Uh, the only time I would say have two at the back is if somebody really hates volleying, and they're much more comfortable with that back, back and forth. But, you guys are fine at the net, so I'm not comfortable. Of course, if you get lobbed, you can both go back then. But again, try to get yourself back in at some point during, during that. Okay, that, that, you happy with that one? Yeah, when you speak one at the front, one at the back. Yes. I mean, say you, uh, your front player is is sort of protecting the, the trams almost, and the back player is way over there. You've got a massive gap between the two players, haven't you? Yeah. For, for I'm going to... The drill I'll do on court, I'll show you where, I've just done it with the, the last group they did with that, I'll, I'll show you exactly where you need to stand as a pair to cover all of the court without having to move. Um, <coughs> so that, that will help massively. <laughs> yeah. When to play defensively and when to attack. The rule of 10, I call it the rule of 10. If you're hitting a 5 out of 10, that's a rally pace. So if both players are at 5 out of 10, there's no advantage, the ball's going back and forth. As soon as there's an opportunity, for example, the person at the other end hits a slower shot, a 3 out of 10, then I need to hit an attacking shot, so I'm going to go for a 7 out of 10. If our opponents attack and do a 6 out of 10, I'm going to match that and do a 4 out of 10 back. So that way, anytime they increase the speed, we're looking to defend and decrease the speed. And any time they have a slower speed, we look to have a faster speed. So we're counteracting what they're doing at the other end. If you try to attack an attacking shot, that's when you miss. And if you defend a defensive shot, they're going to kill it. So make sure you've got that nice balance of both. Rally until there's an opportunity. Attack when you get the chance. Don't just attack randomly. Try to attack when the ball comes in slower or shorter, or you feel like there's a, you know, a big gap in the, in the corner there. You don't always have to attack with speed. Attacking could just be a drop shot. A drop shot is an aggressive shot because you're putting your opponent under pressure. So that's attacking, defending. Do it the right time, and the right time is when something changes in the rally. If, if your rally's going and nothing's changing, keep going, be patient, and wait for the right time, chance to attack. How to play and how to defend Australian formation. So, who, who asked that one? So some people, got, are you talking about eye formation where they stand? Uh, yes, and also um, the girl that was serving yeah. the left-hander, you know, you don't know where they are. Okay, yeah. so it, it's an interesting one. Not many people do it, but if they do, so um, I'm, I assume you're talking about eye formation where yeah, I do, I if do. my partner's yeah. serving and yeah. I'm at the net, instead of standing here, some players at professional level, they do it for us. They'll stand here. And then when the serve goes over this person, over this way, and plays on this side. So then you've got a down the line rally going, and then two volleys facing each other. Is that is that what yeah, they did? So the girl that was serving was a left hander, so it was really hard to read where it was going to go. And it was just, it changed it completely there. Yeah, yeah. it threw you completely. Yeah. So the um, thing is, as soon as they've done it once, talk to your partner, and the, the main thing is that you just get over the fact that they've changed something because it is it throws you doesn't yeah, it so do, you, do you just ignore it just try just to it. Yeah, try to yeah, but try uh, to but know that they it. might do it again yeah. so just yeah, to kind of speak. yeah because yeah, yeah. yeah. it doesn't happen often no, enough no, to really no. have to work it's on not bad enough, no. yeah fighting so if they duck down like that 
So I formation, what, what pros do is they'll talk, they'll signal behind their back so they either go this way or this way. And it just means that they've got the option to go either side so that the turner doesn't have any idea of where they should be hitting. It's, it's tough to play against, but at our level I think you can probably combat it easier because they're not going to be quite as sprinty and jumping around. It's just, <laughs> it's just <laughs> mentally it's, it's the pros just just another tactic really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just hitting up. When to hit cross court, when to hit down the middle and percentage shots, and how to win a tie break. Well, that's good, how to win a tie break. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's we all want to win a tie break. Okay. Yeah, we keep losing tie breaks. Cool. When to hit cross court, when to hit down the line, and when to hit and what the percentage shots are. That links in nicely with the drill. So, why would you hit cross court? Trading. Trading, rallying, okay? So you're, you're, you're away from the net player and it gives you more time. Exactly. So during a doubles point, if you're rallying cross court and doing a good job of keeping away from the volley and that can keep going until something changes and somebody should decide to attack. Okay, so that's really, really good. The reason um, cross court is also a good shot is the longer distance from corner to corner, so you've got more room to hit into, you're less likely to hit it long, it's the lower part of the net, so in general, in singles and doubles, it's a much safer shot to hit. Okay. Down the line, you tend to use when you're attacking, so if you get a shorter ball or a slower ball, when we say the three to the seven, that's when we can go down the line as a body player because we're going to put them under a lot of pressure if we hit fast. Or we can attack back at the cross court player and come into the net. When to go down the line if there's a big gap or if you've got a slow, easy ball. Okay? But percentage shots do tend to be cross court as much as possible. Now, in doubles, another really good way that you guys are going to win points is by hitting it through the gap in the middle. But to do that, you've got to create the gap. So when you're in that cross-court rally, we always say deep is good, because if you hit a shot deep, you know that eventually they're going to hit it shorter, okay? It's also going to stop them from attacking. But you're not going to create any space by hitting it deep. The best shot in doubles, the most effective that I find, is the short cross-court angle that pulls your opponent right out of the court, creates a huge gap in the middle, it gives your volley player when it goes wide, the volley player will cover the line and there'll be a huge gap in the middle to just tap it down there. So I suggest that we all practice the shorter, wider angles when we're in our rallies. We always say deep is good because it means that um, our opponents can't attack. And there is a risk to them if you aim short and wide that it could set them up for an easy one. But if we practice it, we're going to get much, much better at that. So that's a really good effective shot, especially on the forehand side. It's a lot easier to do than the backhand. So, we're going to get into some hitting. Um, the final thing was about volley positions. Now, we spoke about how close to the net and how far back we should stand, but we didn't really talk about what happens side to side. Now, we, I think we all know in this group, if Anne's on my team serving, and I'm at the net, when Anne serves out wide, I need to cover my line. So, all I do is I follow where the ball's gone. So Anne's ball goes this way, I go this way. If Anne's serve goes down the tee to this side and the player has to move this way, I can look to come across and poach. And if you think of those two movements and you know where your partner's trying to serve, you're going to be much quicker at getting to the volley and hitting the next shot. That can also happen during the rally. So if, if the ball goes back cross court and they're rallying with Anne, when Anne hits the wide ball, I follow it. And if the ball goes more central, I'll follow it. So we're constantly tracking the player at the other end. As long as you're moving, yeah? Where does Anne go? So, um, so Anne, what, what, when she's served? Yeah. You've gone wide. Yeah. In a rally? Good question. So, if Anne's hit a really wide shot, what is that person's option? Yeah. Wide or wide? So what we actually do is we split. Okay. I go this way, and Anne comes in slightly more. Anne, you go. You, so you would go across to here. Do you want to turn the camera there? There you go. So you go here. Now the reason being, you're going to say there's a big gap in the middle now if we split, right? Now my normal position is here. If I step across to cover my line, I'm not Jeez. stepping across to the tram line because I can reach the tram line from here. So if I'm here, this is as wide as I'll go. Now in just one step and a reach, my racket gets to here. Remember that person's in the corner. For them, for them
said to hit the shot, and it travels to my furthest point, that would go all the way over to here. And you can see that just in one step, I've covered two thirds of the court. So Anne doesn't need to stay over here. That's why she can go wide, because I've got that covered. Does that make sense now? So it looks like there's a big gap, because if you were looking from straight on, there wouldn't be a big gap. But when you're looking from that corner, there's not a big gap. So anytime the ball goes really wide, volley player should always cover it. And this player doesn't really need to cover my gap here. They can go out that way. If they lob. So it, a lob is always slow. So if that person has got up, that's a really good shot that they've played there. Anne's quick enough to cover around. That's quick enough. Good. So Anne would go across and I would switch, yeah. Unless I can reach this one. Cool. Any questions on that? It all seems a bit clearer when you look at it with lines and things on the court, but it's putting it into practice that makes it better. You guys can come on. You guys can come on. Don't worry, don't mind us. Um, so let's let's have a little practice exercise.